seeing all your smiling faces, but please turn your camera off while we're doing the bulk of this insurance uh, workshop, just so that our speakers can identify the timer for timing purposes. Thank you. I do appreciate it. We'll get this going this evening. And our first speaker is probably somebody that many of you already know, because he at one time was a member of five different clubs. He's also served a year as area director, and there aren't a lot of Toastmasters anywhere in the world more dedicated to the organization than our next speaker. So please help me welcome, with his tall tale, my first car in Canada, Madan Bata. My first car in Canada, Madan, take it away. About two years back, when I came to Canada, the first thing I did was I bought a car because I needed it to go to my job. The next day was a heavy snowfall. When there is a snowfall back home in Nepal, from where I came, we don't drive. But, and that happens rarely. I decided not to drive. I came outside of my home, but on the road I saw vehicles were moving as smoothly as they were in normal days. So I thought to drive myself too. I started my car just 100 meters away from my home. My car started skidding, moving on left to right of the road, and it was uncontrollable. Then it banged on the wall of a bank. Fortunately, that was just a snow bank and no, ban no major damage. For 10 minutes, I was rocking back and forth, and finally, I was able to escape from that trap. I drove back to my home slowly in a tortoise speed and went inside the home. That day, I didn't go to my job. I called my friend and he told to change the winter tire and to install winter tires. That was the first day I heard about winter tires in my life. Then I started searching Google. In Google, there I found the price of tire was climbing more than the price of my car. So I decided to look something used one in Kijiji. And there I got a best deal. The price was almost 30% of the original new tires with rims. And the man was even ready to install those tires in my car. Next day, I went to him. He installed the tires and I was driving as smoothly as other normal days. Even there was heavy snowfall, I didn't get disturbed. But one day, I was driving my car from behind a police van was coming. After a while, they pulled me over. One of the men came to me and told, you are overdriving, over speeding. I debated him because I am a very conscious driver. I told him I was looking on my speedometer all the time. So I can't believe. If you don't believe, you can check. He came inside the car and another man drove his car and the man was inside my car, I drove. He saw my speedometer, was running on 60 kilometers per hour. From behind, the, another policeman said, the car is running on 72 kilometers per hour. Then he told me to stop the car and asked me to go immediately to the mechanics. I went, I followed his words and went to the mechanics. I shared all his stories to him. Then he checked the tire 
and there he found the tires were two inch in diameter bigger than the original tires. That day I knew the secret of GCG, why the products are cheaper there. And the mechanics told you should change tires immediately. Then I calculated the price again. The brand new tires with rims would climb the price of my car. So I decided rather to sell my car and buy another one. That is the story of my first car in Canada. And I learned a lot, even though I lost lots of time and effort to maintain that. But, the, but that story helped me to learn a lot about the road and about a car in Canada. Back to your Toastmaster. Thank you, Madan. Thank you very much. I can only imagine what winter driving must be like for somebody who's not accustomed to winter. That brings us to Madan's circle of gold. Ladies, would you turn on your camera and give Madan some feedback, please? The order of the evaluations tonight will be myself, Nandini, followed by Darlene, and then followed by Val. Madan, I want to say some of the things I loved about your speech. I love the fact that you gave us a topic that we could all relate to. And that's the fastest way to build connection is for you to what it's like problems that happen. I thought you picked a really good topic that could lend itself well to a tall tale. I want to tell you my favorite parts where I thought you had potential, where you had really good climax. Anytime that a police car is chasing us or chasing you in this particular case, it is a great way to build up. And I think that you could have used this as a build up in terms of your speech so that Suddenly you look in the rear view mirror, you notice the lights and you felt a sense of panic. And I think what might help in your speech is to give us a sense of your feelings while it's happening so that we can connect to it. We all know what that feeling is like of being pursued by a police officer and then having to pull over. And I'm going to encourage you to keep working on that. If you built the character of a big, beefy, burly policeman suddenly coming to the car and thumping on the car, and you being a small, quiet man from Nepal trembling, we would get a sense of the two characters, you and the police officer. And then if you could use a different voice for the police officer, this would help in building your climax. I do want to say, Madan, that I like the fact that you picked a topic that we could relate to. I think you had opportunity, not only when something went wrong with your car at the beginning, I thought there was another opportunity for you to build the story when something was going wrong with your car, of never having driven before. I thought that was an amazing idea. We could all relate to it, but you need to go into the details. Tell us how you felt what you saw in terms of the snow coming down, in terms of it coming down so heavily, you couldn't see anything, in terms of skidding and losing control of your car, what kind of noise did the tires make? Did they squeal when it happened? I think that you have an opportunity not only to build on the stories, put in the details, but also to really paint a vivid picture of what it's like to drive for the first time in winter by giving us and using your senses. What did you see? What did you hear? What did you feel? And I don't know if you can smell anything, but if you can, you should bring that in too. But I wanna say, the thing that I liked the most was that when you delivered this speech, you had stories that were potentially engaging. I think you just need to elaborate on it. And I can't wait to hear my fellow evaluators Darlene and Val, when they can just take your speech and give you suggestions to take it to the next level of a tall tale. Darlene, take it away. 
Thank you, Nandini, and thank you, Madan. My job is to look at speech techniques, which is the second part of the judge's ballot. And I was uh, very interested in hearing what you had to say. You very successfully used a twist in your speech. You said that you banged on the wall of a bank. And then, and then you told us it was a snowbank. And I would like to see you even exaggerate that more. I you know, slammed into the wall of a bank and it was so, you know, just give it a more energy and exaggerate. And then, and then let us know it was a monstrous snowbank that you slithered into. That would really help give us some exaggeration because what we're talking about in Tall Tales is an, a normal situation in which you've exaggerated hugely. Another place, place where you can do some exaggeration is uh, the price of the, tar the tire. You did exaggerate. You said the price of the tire was almost the price of a, my car. And I'm thinking there, wow, <laughs> that's a pretty expensive tire. And if you got four of them, that could have been the price of four cars. You know, give it a little bit of exaggeration. And then you got it 30% off. But here's the thing about the 30% off. These tires were very strange tires because when you started to drive, it was speeding you. You couldn't stop. It was just going so fast. And then like Nandini said, you could use alliteration. A big, beefy, burly policeman was, came up behind me and said, you're speeding. And you're saying, no, I'm not speeding. My, my speedometer says, 60 kilometers, but he said, you said 72, Let, let's make this bigger. You were going 172 kilometers an hour, whatever, whatever it is you wanna do. I just think that that would help in, in um, making this a really um, exciting and interesting tall tales. I love the fact that you used humor. You have very subtle humor and I think your humor is good to just keep on doing that. Your exaggeration was there, but just make it bigger, make it, I mean, I gave you examples that you might not like, but you could just make it bigger and make it more exciting. And then you, that brings us up to the climax that Nandini was looking for. And then um, you can come down again by just maybe relating it to a pun or some kind of saying that's very popular in, um, that you know of and just, maybe relate to that and twist it a little bit so that it's no longer the same. And I wish I could think of something right off the top of my head, but I can't. But I'm sure that Laura can, and probably in her nugget section, she'll give you an idea. I thought you did really well with your speech techniques. Just make it more, make it more humorous, more exaggeration, and more, and more interesting. And I'll now pass it over to Val. Thank you, Madame. Thank you, Darlene. Madan, I am wondering if you can turn your camera on. Any chance you could do that? Ah, awesome. Hi, Madan. Hi. You had me right at the very beginning. Your very first line had me captivated. I really I wanted to hear what this tall tale is about. And uh, the essence behind a tall tale primarily is about the exaggeration, which is what Darlene was speaking about. And so I was looking for that. My job in this feedback to you, for you to accept if you want or discard it if you don't like it or pay it forward to someone else, is to evaluate you or give you feedback on your physical appearance, your body language, your voice, your flexibility, flexibility and vo volume, and also the speech appropriateness. And I found that your speech appropriateness was great. This is a tall tale. This is about, um, it could be a funny topic, which it was. Now, what I thought that you, in terms of your body language, I did notice that you were clasping your hands together a lot. Now, just in regular speeches, that is one of the positions that we try to get people to break out of. But in terms of a tall tale and exaggeration, I think you can use your body language to make everything massive. And it just so happens that you're from Nepal, which is also where Mount Everest is. So 
have you got an opportunity to use exaggeration? Absolutely. You could potentially use your hands to describe just how monstrous the same word that Darlene was talking about is what I wrote down too, monstrous or gigantic or gargantuan um, snowbank the size of Mount Everest. It's huge, right? Really exaggerated. We know that that's not really true, but this is a tall tale, so it needs to be huge. And when you were moving along, I also wrote down exaggerate on your price as well. And so one way you can also exaggerate on your price is just bring something ludicrous, like ludicrous. These, these tires and this car was the, the same price as a Tesla by the time you are done. Or 10 Teslas. We know how much Teslas are. They're, they're, they're very expensive. I thought that you... Um, have an opportunity because it's a tall tale to really use a lot more descriptive and bigger words. So if you even use the thesaurus and find any word in your speech and just look at what an, an outrageous meaning, like to make it exaggerated and huge for one little simple word, you can start adding in little drops of humor that are just sprinkled throughout your whole speech. You spoke about... Um, the police van. And I thought this is an opportunity for you to have a superpower. You could jump out of the car, let the cop go in the car and you run alongside it going 60 kilometers an hour telling him, yeah, you see, it's 60 kilometers an hour that I'm running because I know I can run that. That's the speed I run. Something along that lines to exaggerate your own superhuman power. And what I liked the best about this section of your speech is you have really good voice volume. You have really good pacing. You have an accent. There's a few words that you got a little wrong in the English language, but because you spoke in a nice, easy cadence, it was very simple to follow along. And I really encourage you to incorporate some of this gargantuan exaggeration and take this speech to the next level. I'll pass this over for some nuggets, some golden nuggets to Laura. Over to you, Laura. Laura. Yes, oh, Laura. yes, sorry. <laughs> yes, up, down, up, down. I could write a speech about that. Thank you so much, Madan. I enjoyed this even more than I did the first time I heard you give it. I agree with everything that the Circle of Gold team has said to you. This speech is not quite a tall tale yet, but it has all the elements that are needed to turn it into a crazy story about going way too fast because your tires were way too big. And I think if you were to just rework a little bit of it, to add in the exaggeration that the three ladies were talking about, that you have a true tall tale. Um, turn your camera on just for a moment, because I want to ask you, did you find your feedback helpful this evening? Yeah, they are very helpful. And of course, I will work on that. And uh, next time, obviously, I'll bring a speech with lots of exaggeration and whatever they told me, I'll, I'll take all the feedbacks seriously and compete in our club contest. Do you have any questions about anything that was said to you this evening? Do you have any remarks or questions that we can help with? Yeah, I have one question. Like I spoke uh, on this topic before as well, as you told, to speak on the same, uh, same, with same contents. So I have a question that is this story, this is kind of a real story. So can I go to another story or I can make a tall tale out of and this, this story also. Okay, if I understand your question is, could you take this true story and turn it into a good tall yeah. tale? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You've heard my speech about zip lining in Belize, right? Yeah. And, and the zip line broke and I fell into the water and all of that. That started off as a true story. I did go zip lining in Belize, 
the rest of it was pure imagination. So, so, so I can bring unbelievable exaggeration or the believable one. Now you see, I think that's entirely up to you. I think that's the, the speaker's choice, whether it's believable enough to make your audience wonder, was that a true story? Or so over the top that it's just hilariously entertaining and obviously a tall tale. That would be your choice. I think that's every speaker's choice. Ladies, do you agree with me? Yeah, I want to say, Madan, I thought your tale, your story today had so much potential because it's something we can all relate to. Driving in the winter, getting pulled over by a police officer, sliding. So those are wonderful, real elements. And if you just add some of the tips of exaggeration and making it bigger and have fun with it. Part of the tall tales is we, you know it's a bit of a lark. You know you're having fun with us. If you can just add some of that along with the exaggeration, I think you'll have a fantastic speech. I would really encourage you to take this speech and take it to the next level because you can for sure. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I agree. Val, did you have something to say? Okay, all right. Any other questions, Madan, before we move on? No, now I don't have questions. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming and giving that speech this evening. I truly appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening, also somebody that most of the people in this room will know, because she has been in Toastmasters for a long time well, more years than we want to talk about. And much like me, she also took a break somewhere in the middle. She is, let me think, she was a member of the only tall club in Calgary back in the early 90s. She was a member of Bedstone Olympic back then. And one of the funniest women you will ever meet. She's going to need her sense of humor in this upcoming year because she is also our current district director. And it is my absolute privilege and pleasure to introduce Katrina Aburro with her speech, I am a winner. I am a winner, Katrina Aburro. Thank you, Laura. Yesterday, I had an amazing day at the mall, which some people like to call my second home. I discovered that some clothing I wanted was available not online, but I could pick it up at Sunridge Mall. I trucked on over to the mall and my day got even better when I got there because I thought I was going to owe $56, but instead I only owed $6 because it turned out that my gift card wasn't for $5, it was for 50. Isn't it great when you get confused by the zero and it works in your favor? Because I was in such a great mood on the way out of the mall, I was lured into a convenience store by a chocolate bar that I hadn't seen around in a while. And I thought, what luck, I'm gonna get to have one of those chocolate bars I haven't had in ages, sign me up. While I was paying for it, there was a big flashing sign that was for a lotto. It was for $15 million. The lady said, would you like to buy a ticket? And I normally say no, but then I thought, you know what they say, you never win if you don't buy a ticket. So right before I went to bed, a thought flashed in my mind. I haven't checked the numbers. I should see what happened with that ticket. I opened up my computer and you wouldn't believe it. Twice in one day, I got the zero wrong. It wasn't for 15 million. It was for 150 million. Mind you, what do I care? I always lose. So I checked my numbers and surprise of surprises. Each time I checked another number, it kept being correct. I got to the last number and it said nine and my number said nine. Oh my God, I'm a winner of $150 million. I was so excited, I was beside myself. I thought, what do I do first? And then I realized 
realized I know what I'm going to do first. I am going to decimate my alarm clock with a hammer. I'm going to saunter into work late tomorrow and tell them I won $150 million. They won't even be mad at me because I can throw gobs of cash at them. And then when people say my glasses are loose, I'm going to say, I don't care. I quit. When they say my glasses are sliding, I'm going to say, I don't care. I quit. Then I'm going to take care of my family. I'm going to go Oprah. Instead of being, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car, I'm going to be saying, you get a house and a car, you get a house and a car, you get a house and a car. And then what else am I going to do? I'm going to take every bucket trip I've ever dreamed of. I'm going to the Amazon to see monkeys. I'm going to Africa to see zebras. I'm going to Austria or uh, Antarctica to see penguins and the Arctic to see polar bears. And because I'm filthy rich, I'm going to be accompanied by the like premier of wildlife specialists who are my personal friends, of course, because I put scads of money into the World Wildlife Fund. But then I realized, you know what? $150 million is a lot of money. Even after I bought three vacation homes and a new home, and I have 10 Lamborghinis, I'm still going to have a lot of money left. What am I going to do? I know I'm going to do what other rich people do. I'm going to invest. I'm going to make even more money off my money. I'm going to live large and still have more in the bank growing. I am going to outgrow the wealth of my rich uncle. So then what am I going to do? Hmm. I think I'm going to have to call up Elon Musk because he's my friend. I'm going to have to say, I now am worth billions. You have to bump one of your billionaire friends off SpaceX and you have to take me out to space. And I think we should have a special trip to the moon because I want to scout for my next adventure. Hmm, I know what I'm going to do. I am going to open up the Shoot for the Star Spa. You can sleep in the premier pillow, the most comfortable bed, and go to sleep having heavenly dreams from the sea of serenity. And I think there'll be outbound adventures. And I think there will be a restaurant where the best food is not only like the sky's the limit, the sky is not the limit. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be an entrepreneur opening up businesses on the moon. Oh, it was so exciting. I was getting tired just thinking about all the amazing things I was going to do with my wealth. And then I looked at the screen again. Wait. That's not 150 million, that's 15 million. And, and wait, that's not a nine, that's an eight. Oh, I got it wrong. I am not a winner. <laughs> Hi, Katrina, it's me, Val. That was fantastic. Okay, I, yeah, hi, how are you? I am first to evaluate you and I am speaking on your speech development. And that includes your opening, your build up into the climax, the organization and the smoothness of your speech. And right off the bat with your speech title, I'm a winner. I leaned in, I wanted to hear more. What, what's she going to win? What is this? And how is she going to spin this into an exaggerated tall tale? So I was pretty eager. I really, I liked your opening. You, you, you were just run of the mill, your day off work or your after work, and you're just going to go tootle off to the mall like all the rest of us, as you did yesterday. And that makes it interesting because I started thinking, okay, how much, where is she going to go with this? The interesting thing about tall tales is that gives the audience the opportunity to go, huh, where is she going to go with this? Because you know it's going to be something absurd. And I love money. So I thought, this is perfect. You cashed in your, your gift certificate and realized you had a little extra money in your pocket. So why not splurge it on a lottery ticket? Fantastic. One thing though, I think that $150 million winning is not that exaggerated. I actually think it could be a billion. 
150 billion, especially since later on you relate, you call your best, one of your best friends, Elon Musk. And of course there's space on SpaceX for billionaires and you're now a billionaire. So it actually didn't really uh, jive there, right? So I think you could maybe be 150 billion that you thought you won. That would be a really good ex exaggeration. I think that also when you talk, you spoke about the chocolate bar, maybe you kind of see a chocolate bar. I'd like you to find that chocolate bar, that chocolate bar you haven't had since you were a kid. You know, you can Google and find all those old chocolate bars, like, I don't know, like those lick made things or something. That's not a chocolate bar, but something. And then, you know what, you're, a, you're, you've got 50 bucks in your pocket. So you can maybe buy 20 of them or 50 of them or something like that. So you don't just buy one chocolate bar, you buy a ton of them, the massive amounts of them. And then uh, one thing too is in the organization, I got a little bit, not lost, but a little bit abrupt when you all of a sudden jumped right into bed and you hadn't left the mall yet. So it was a little bit uh, sudden for me, but I think another opportunity for exaggeration, like you're so excited with this lottery ticket, you raced Madon in his skidding car home or something and, and ran along beside him. Maybe you were measuring the 60 kilometers an hour. I don't know. <laughs> and again, what I liked the most about your speech was the excitement that you brought. You, you brought it up and I noticed your voice got stronger and stronger and stronger, like you're taking us onto that crescendo. And then the climax, which was, oh man, you got the zero wrong and you got the number wrong. And you were like, oh, and it was just a nice closed uh, chapter at the end. And over to you, Nandini. Thanks, Val. Katrina, I loved the fact that you gave us a tale of how to spend money. Oh, it's a topic that we all dream about, we wish about, and I think this is a fantastic story that you could just take it to the extra mile. I'll tell you what I loved. I loved the fact that the minute you got this money, you were thinking big, and I think that's important. And I loved the fact that you made it relevant, that you wanted to go with Elon Musk, who is now, of course, one of your friends. And I think you had opportunity for us to go on this trip that all of us dream about and never get to go on with some of the details, like being in this amazing rocket that goes billions and billions and billions of miles per second, right? You had opportunities there. I think the fact that Elon Musk probably looks bigger and bigger in person rather than what we see on the TV. And I think you had opportunity to really exaggerate Elon Musk and make him this big, bold billionaire. And not only in the amount of money he has, but really a camera not only puts on weight, but it puts on height. And you could have made him six foot six and you never thought he would be like that. I also liked the fact that you are spending money like Oprah. It was one of my favorite phrases because all of us again, wanna be like Oprah. And I thought you had a great opportunity when you talked about, and you've got a house and you've got a car and you've got a house, and you've got a car. And I thought the rule of three, you could have flipped it on the last one and said, you know, you got a house and you got a trip with Elon Musk, like flip it around so that the rule of three, so we're not predicting the twist there. I also like the fact that you had a twist at the end. And I thought it went really well with the fact that you work in uh, as an optometrist and suddenly you had problems seeing the numbers. I thought that was a great twist at the end. I thought how wonderful to tell everybody, you know, I've got money, I don't need this job and have to crawl back and get the job. So I liked the way that you did the irony there. I thought you had great alliteration. I'm looking at technique and alliteration is one of the aspects and you had shoot for the stars and you had the sea of serenity and I thought, Oh, that was building a nice picture. I wanna say, I think that you had more opportunity to go bigger and bolder. I've heard you speak. And I think every time that you speak, you've got an opportunity here to just milk the money really out of all of us. So I'm gonna encourage you, when you go to work, I think you should exaggerate it. It's gotta be big 
like you want the peons at your work to feel your money and you're not only going to quit but you're going to make them pay for all the things that you've had to do when you didn't have the money i think you've got opportunity in the optometry office before you spend your billions as val suggested but i'm looking forward to the next version of this wherever you share your tall tale and katrina i'll be your friend whether you're a billionaire or a millionaire or you just have 15 bucks as long as you've got the chocolate thanks kat well, hi katrina we'll turn it over to darlene <laughs> hi katrina it's uh, my honor to take a look at the physical and the voice and the appropriateness and this is um Bendini, did you turn off your mute? Katrina, would you say something so I can see you? <laughs> yep. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> what, what I wanted to do was to share with you some tips that I have learned over the past about using the video. So what I see right now is that I only see you from here up. And so all of your gestures, all of the things that you were doing were below the camera. And I think it, that you're just such an energetic, happy person. It would really be helpful to see some of your, some of your upper body and some of your, um, your hand gestures so that we can see that. Your excitement was just contagious. I, I was uh, have, spending that money with you. I, just re I was on that trip, thought this is so great. And I love the things that you decided to do. They were also specific. You used great grammar in doing that. But it was the appearance and the body language and the use of the camera that really struck me for a possibility for you to improve for your next. I know you're not going to compete in Tall Tales this time, but you might next year. So let's, let's just think about that. So just your shoulders into the camera, your hand gestures in the space so that we can see it. And you can even move forward or back so that we can get some sense. How far away was that? Uh, get a sense of how you would be using that space and make it real and big for us. Your voice, and um, you are a very energetic and positive and humorous speaker. And I love the, the excitement that you showed in your voice. A suggestion I have for you for then another time is to think about the pitch that you're speaking at. As you got more excited, you got a higher pitch. And uh, women do that a lot. So just to be conscious about lowering the pitch so that we would be able to get what you're saying more easily. Um, your volume was great, although you could have, what if I, what if I just went into off the office and told them to stop it? <laughs> you know, so we have a little bit of a, a change in the in the volume. As far as appropriateness was concerned, I thought it was very appropriate. I totally was in the story. I was spending the money, like I said, with you, and I was so disappointed it wasn't real because I was looking forward to going to that spa in the sky. I just the star spa for, shoot for the star spa. I just thought that was a really exciting idea. And I would have liked to see you use more to de describe how I would get there. And you might even have a free trip for people who were, you know, white haired or something so that I could go. But I just, I really enjoyed your speech. And I thought the other people that were giving you feedback gave you some good hints. And I'd like to see you again, do a tall tale. And over to you, Laura. Thank you, Darlene. And thank you, Katrina. I agree with everybody this evening. I think that that speech had the makings of a true tall tale. I know that you've been incredibly busy lately, although I'm not really sure why you're only district director. But I, and I could see that you were reading your notes a little bit. So I'm going to guess that this speech had very little prep time. And it astounds me, first of all, that your imagination can come up with something like that and flesh it out as quickly as you must have, and then present it and make it funny and make it into a tall tales as well as you did. I think, as the lady said tonight, with very little tweaking, that could be an excellent, excellent tall tale. 
Do you have any question for the Circle of Gold team? No? No, no questions. I, everything was really on point. Um, some of the things I already know about, I always have to watch my pitch because I can be screechy. <laughs> so, so that was great. Okay. All right. Well, audience, that leaves one last speaker. And of course, that's going to be me. So I will introduce myself, if you don't mind. Our next speaker is a phenomenal woman. She swims the English Channel just for exercise and has been a long-standing member of Toastmasters. In fact, she believes it's the only thing that has kept her alive in her old age. So please help me welcome our next speaker, Laura Chambers, Learning to Golf. Learning to Golf, Laura Chambers. I plan to retire later this year. So I have spent a lot of time recently thinking about oh, hobbies and activities and, and pursuits that I should take up just to keep me active and healthy. I do believe I'm just a little too old to take up bronc busting or maybe even rock climbing. So I chose golf. I have never golfed, but most of my friends already do. So it seemed prudent to think that maybe a few golf lessons with a pro might be a good place to start. I called all the golf courses and all the golf clubs in and around Calgary and do you know how expensive golf is? I almost come to the conclusion that there was no way that I could afford something like that in retirement. And then I stumbled across the link for the Shady Hollow Golf Resort. I gave them a call, talked to a lovely lady who kept mentioning things like lifestyle changes and healthy living. And their rates were about half of everybody else's. So I gave her my credit card number and I booked a lesson with their pro for the coming Saturday. When I got there that weekend, I was thrilled to see what a beautiful place it was. And as I walked through the clubhouse front doors, my eyes were immediately drawn. The full back wall was wall to wall windows, floor to ceiling. It was a stunning view. And as I looked out over the beautiful green golf course, now, you know, my vision isn't what it used to be, but boy, I would have sworn that everybody out there in the distance was wearing matching outfits. So I turned to the young man behind the counter and I said, do you have a dress code here? He looked shocked. And then he kind of winked and grinned at me. But before I could pursue that thought, I heard my name being called and I turned to greet the golf pro who was going to give me my lesson. We chatted for a minute and he pointed me in the direction of the ladies changing room and told me that he would meet me out on the golf course. I went and stowed all my things in a locker and went out onto that beautiful green grass, very excited. And again, all those golfers out in the distance, I, I kept looking at them thinking, I'm sure they're all wearing the same thing. But again, before I could spend too much thought on it, I heard my voice, my name being called, and I turned to greet the golf pro. And that is when the day got really weird. He was naked, stark naked. He was wearing his shoes and his golf bag. I was, I was shocked. I turned around. So then I thought, no, no, I couldn't possibly have seen that. So I turned to take another look and oh, I was right the first time. He was stark naked. I turned my back, I covered my eyes out of respect for his lost modesty. modesty. And as I stood there, suddenly I could hear a group of men laughing and talking. When I looked, oh God, 
four men in a similar state of undress were now standing about 50 feet from me, all with their back to me in a semicircle, standing around something I couldn't identify. But I'll tell you, the view in that direction was safer than the view in that direction, but not for long. A second later, they turned and they all started towards me. And the first thought was, oh, they were using the ball washer? The second thought was, oh my God, am I ever grateful for Toastmasters training on how to maintain eye contact. I stood there and waited and they, they came right to me and one of the gentlemen said, oh, we have a new member. Oh, and dear, you look terribly uncomfortable. But don't worry, you'll soon become accustomed and you will embrace the nudist lifestyle. Nudist? My courage deserted me. I was gone. I sat in the ladies' changing room for a while, trying to figure out what my options were, and it seemed to come down to two. I could either strip naked and go take my golf lesson, or I could go home with my tail between my legs. And you know what? Neither of those choices sounded good. But eventually I realized I had a third choice, and that's the one I went with. Mustering up all the dignity that I could, head held high, I walked out of that golf club house, got in my car and went home, where I immediately sat down at my computer and brought up Weight Watchers and joined. Because the way I see it, if I work the Weight Watchers program by next spring, I'll be ready to go back for my golf lesson. Miss, Madam Toastmaster. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not often that I laugh out loud on a video presentation, but I was laughing all the way through that. And I'm not even doing appropriateness with you, Laura. So <laughs> somebody else is doing that, but it was really funny. One of the things they said on one of the um, sites that I looked at was that um, humor. Um, you can be appropriate, uh, but it's adult, it's an adult story, and the speaker should be talking in a chaste manner. And that's exactly what you did. You, you talked about all of this thing, but you had this, oh, I can't believe this is happening. This is so innocent, so sweet. <laughs> I just loved it. So some of the things that I loved about your story. First, I mean, it is a tall tale, I hope. <laughs> Um, I love the fact that you set up the story really well. So you set it up that I'm going to retire. I can't do rock climbing. What am I going to do? And you went through all of the things that you're going to do. And you thought you'd take golf lessons. And I'm, I'm following along in the story being led, you know, like, you know through the nose. <laughs> through this, I'm just really enjoying it. And did you know how expensive golf was? I just love that, the way you used your voice. And the Shady Hollow Golf Course was half the price. I'm thinking now the way your tone of voice is going and everything, there's a catch here. I'm not sure what the catch is, but you've got me building up so that I understand that. And then you kept saying everybody was wearing my matching outfits. And I'm kind of thinking, like, is it a, is it a place like a mental institution or is it, a, you know, what is it? And I haven't clued in yet until you met the golf pro. And I thought you build up to that climax really, really well. And the fact that you said he only had his shoes in his golf bag, like all your descriptions were so beautiful that they really made me feel like I, I was there. <laughs> I, I was really enjoying that. And I loved your humor, the Toastmaster training on how to maintain eye contact. I just, I was burst out laughing then. I couldn't help it because I didn't realize that the eye contact thing was so important in life. And I didn't realize how important it was for golf. <laughs> so really well done. I thought your story was really well organized. You led us up gently to the, to the naked guy thing. And I, I was really happy. I wasn't sure about the ball wash. <laughs> I didn't know how they all got muddy, but <laughs> um, oh dear. <laughs> Speaking of appropriateness, 
Okay, so I, I thought really, as far as the, the first part of it, speech development, I thought you did amazingly well. And you had us, you described things, you felt like we were there, you led us up to the climax. And even your end, where you said, I've got two choices. Um, I didn't know which choice you were going to make. And then you came up with the Weight Watchers and then you were gonna join next year. And I'm going, oh, Laura, don't do that. <laughs> so you had me involved and I've enjoyed it so much. And, and now it's over to um, Val for speech techniques. Thank you, Laura, for your speech. Thanks, Darlene. Yes, hi, Laura. My turn to provide you feedback on the speech technique. And I have to tell you, Laura, do you know that I'm a golfer? Uh-huh. And, and so there are so many golfing puns out there that I was, I couldn't wait when you started talking about golf. I thought, oh, good. I'm so excited to hear this. And I like, like uh, Darlene was laughing. So the, I mean, <laughs> Shady Hollow, and now you don't even know why you've named it that until you realize they're all nude. And so fabulous use of a funny, I don't know, foreshadowing little trick, a little bit of a pun sort of. And then you kept speaking about the uh, everybody out on the golf course all wearing the same clothes, what is going on? And of course that wasn't revealed until the surprise twist at the end. So, it, you know, in terms of uh, the, the ingredients and the recipe for a tall tale and you hit like three or four of the techniques used in that are useful in speech techniques along with your exaggeration especially being naked. I mean, you don't really need to exaggerate that much more. <laughs> it's pretty descriptive. And again, that little adding in what the ball washer is just hysterical. There is, um, there you used irony in there as well with the people out on the golf course already naked. I think that because there's so many opportunities in golf to use puns, that are highly inappropriate, but you are so skilled at taking inappropriate things and making it pretty good. I myself have been golfing and holding the shaft in my hand since I've been about three, for instance. And I've been trying to ram that thing in the hole for 50 years. There are plenty of opportunities for you to use some kind of inappropriateness. I mean, I'm sweating even just, <laughs> I am I'm like, oh my God, this is way beyond what I am comfortable saying, but I'm saying it because I know that you have the skill <laughs> to be able to make this into, you know, a little more appropriate than the way I just did. And the thing I like the, the best is that you can take, it's using your voice. You can take all of this and make it just like, I'm, we're sitting down for coffee and you're telling me the story. I mean, I golf. I know people aren't, well, I'm pretty sure people aren't golfing nude, but you had me hooked. I was like, man, she's saying this like it's absolutely 100% true. So well done to you. <laughs> I loved it. And I'll pass it over to Nandini. Thanks, Val. It's always great to be in the presence of a master of humor. And I think we had a great example of that, Laura, and I think it's terrific that we got a demonstration of what a tall tale really looks like. You had the characters, not only of yourself, but the golf instructor and the members of the club. And you didn't have to say that much because they're not wearing very much, but we got who they were and who the characters were. So I thought you did a great job. And I, the reason I'm saying that is because you did a beautiful job with your voice and you had passion and energy and you changed it when you talked about being almost mortified initially. And you went from a very passionate, enthusiastic voice and you dropped your voice. And I'm gonna encourage you, I think you should drop it a little more because I think that we really relate to any awkward situation with anyone and kind of we get a 
uh, vicarious delight, which is what I think many of us were having today, and to feel the drop of mortification, it's in your voice. So I want more exaggeration to go from, wow, I'm playing golf to, I can't believe. And I almost want you to stutter just a little bit on whatever your dialogue is, just so that we feel it in your voice. I thought you did a great job. Another suggestion I'm gonna encourage is you had lots of beautiful facial expressions. You were using your hands really beautifully. My encouragement though is you had a lot of opportunity the second time round when you saw the second group of men. And I didn't feel like you were as shocked as you could be. And I think you had opportunity for us to feel shocked initially about the golf pro. And then that we're just trying to get over that and lo and behold, you turn in one direction and you can't believe what you're seeing. And I think you can take it to the next level in your face, in your shock. I think you need to, to for us to really just focus only on your face. Now, in terms of appropriateness, I always say every speech, every person can sit on the fence. And I think that there is, it is masterful when you can be on the fence and still bring in ideas in our brains. And we were all there and you didn't have to say very much. And I think that you did it very tactfully. Sometimes I don't always agree with sometimes what my fellow circle of gold people was. And I thought you had an opportunity to say ball washer, but I think you need to play it a little more, a little more wink, a little more so that we're it's not straight to us. We can take it more when you do it tongue in cheek. And I think you've got an opportunity to play with a little more. But Laura, I can't wait to hear your next story, your next golfing story and what happens because when things get weird for you, it's really delightful for the rest of us. Take it away, Laura. Oh, thank you. Thank you, ladies. <clears throat> I think everybody here this evening could tell I had a lot of fun with that speech. And the ball washer thing, it took me forever to figure out how to work that in and make it acceptable. And it was a toss up between that or having the thought, wow, that sure puts a different spin on the word swinging clubs. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, Laura. That's what I'm talking about. It's, golf is full of all that. I made a note, Val. I wrote it down because I'm going to rewrite that speech around some golfing puns. Oh, you. I'll contact me offline. I've got plenty. <laughs> plenty, Thank plenty. You. I don't have any questions other than I think I might have gone a little over time. Madam Timer, what was my time on that? <laughs> Yeah, what was it? Because I was so enthralled, I need to know. <laughs> right, uh, just a smidgen um, by five minutes, 38 seconds. Eight oh. seconds, okay. That's yeah. another thing to work on. It is really difficult to tell a tall tale in three to five minutes <laughs> because one's imagination takes over. <laughs> and so does the listening. ATR, <laughs> get to the good part quicker. <laughs> yeah, I would have to. I'd have Actually, to bump I was, that up. I was thinking that too. If you wanted to shorten it up a little, it would be off the front a little bit and get some exaggeration quicker. Laura, what I really liked about your example tonight of your your tall tale was that when you look at the rule book for to, for tall tales rules, there's not that many, and there are. It is a tall tale speech must be of a highly improbable nature with a theme or a plot bang the second rule is and it it can have humor and props to accentuate it and so the, really the main one was the first one you nailed that you nailed that it's a highly improbable it's highly impro improbable you're going to find that many nude people golfing <laughs> Maybe a few. <laughs> well, if it were probable, I'd have taken up golf a long time ago. Uh -huh. <laughs> I do want to say, Laura, I think that um, for all of us, this is a new opportunity for many people, including ourselves. We haven't had a lot of experience in tall tales. And I do want to say to everyone that 
this is an opportunity to take your skill sets from other contests and try your hand at tall tales. And you don't have to be an expert. None of us are experts at all. We're just building on a foundation and giving it and learning along the way. And I just want to encourage people, we're all learning as we go along and practice. So pick up those judging forms and keep practicing. Yes, thank you, Nandini, that was well said. I wanted to do this workshop and I have presented it at a number of different clubs over the last few weeks for one purpose, and that is that we even the playing field for contestants and judges, because contests are only fun when everybody understands the rules. Mm -hmm. So I hope that we have, <laughs> sorry, I. <laughs> I'm reading comments here and they're making me laugh. <laughs> Sorry. I think that I'm hoping that we've accomplished that this evening. I'm wondering if anybody who wishes to would turn their cameras back on because we've got about 20 minutes that we can now use for questions and answers. We can shoot ideas back and forth. We can talk about topics for uh, tall tales. And we would really, really, really welcome your remarks and your questions. So for anyone who's interested, please turn your cameras back on. Laura, it's Jackie, the timer. Did you want me to give the Katrina and I'm not going to say his name right, Modan, um, their timing? Yes, please. Thank you for thinking about no worries. Yeah, no. Um, so Madan, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, it's um, four minutes and 54 seconds right on the money. Uh, Katrina, you were five minutes and 33 seconds, three seconds over. And then Laura, as you know, you were 538. And, and just for the evaluators, you guys were really good at keeping it within um, three to four minutes. Um, so well done there as well. Thanks, Laura. Back to you. Thank you. Um, Kevin, Kevin just posted a, uh, a question wanting to know if tall tales can be about someone other than yourself. Absolutely. It can be a story about anybody or anything or any place. It, 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 I just happen to find it easier to talk about myself and my own misadventures, but I have heard tall tales done in the past that were done about other people, other places, other events. So yes, absolutely. Did we answer your question, Kevin? Can it be whimsical? Yes. Um, there's no rule that says it has to be humorous even. If somebody has a really good, suspenseful, dramatic tall tale, that works just as well as a humorous one. Yes, Petra, do you have a question? No, you're just saying hello. Hi. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, let's talk about topics. Is there, does anybody have a thought? Laura, or a Laura, I think Sherry has a question. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Sherry. Yes, of course. Go ahead. So I've been working on a tall tale that my mom used to tell as the God honest truth. And I, I still to this day cannot actually believe that it was the God honest truth, but she believes it. So that was fine. But in my, my title of the speech is going to be the day my mom proved she was Wonder Woman. And then it's going to build around this story how she saved my brother from a speeding train when he was only four years old. And she had to leap a 10 foot fence in a single bound and she dove across the train track and rolled with him just seconds before the train splat splattered both of them. And it, it's a, I mean, she swore it was true, but the fact that, you know, it was a story from my childhood that it wasn't until I was probably 14 or 15 that I even started questioning the validity of it, whether it could be true or not. But uh, so that was kind of the, the premise of the speech that I'm working on. Um, I'm trying to decide, am I going to build it up as a suspenseful, oh my God, did she actually die? Or am I going to build it up and then put a twist of humor in the end there? I'm, I'm trying to decide that. So I was just getting, see if I could get some opinions. 
I, for one, think she shouldn't die in a tall tale. I'm thinking <laughs> she should go on to be the star of the, you know, Wonder Woman show or something, something highly exaggerated that you're actually Linda Carter's daughter or something. I don't know. <laughs> That's my yeah. vote. My vote is I want mother to live. <laughs> oh, my mother, absolutely. She only just passed away last year. So yeah, good. She, but she in your lived, tall tale, but... <laughs> I'm hoping that everybody lives. <laughs> you know, when you build it up to that suspense of the train just blew right by and, you know, did it smother them or did it, did she, you know, stand up to the end and brush them all off and everything was fine. But that's, I was just wondering, like, should I make it, try to make it funny at the end or just kind of leave it as, you know, she paddled oh, his butt all the way home from that store, from from that harrowing adventure. Why not write both endings? And then go with the one that in your gut, you know, that's it. Because it's your story, right? And it truly is your family story. So this is, like I've never golfed and I certainly have never been to a nudist colony and I'm never gonna strip down to take a golf lesson. There was zero, zero truth in mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Darlene is relieved. <laughs> so is but, all the men on the course, trust me. Oh, um, wow, but, that's good to know, Laura. <laughs> Sherry, I think it's a great idea to do that speech. And you can, once you write it as, it as you know it, then start with the exaggeration and build that in. And I think you'll have a lot of fun with it. And also we'll be kind of amazed and we'll be very amazed at your story. And probably yeah. wondering at the end, even with all the exaggeration, was it true or not? <laughs> and I think that's a good test for a tall tale that if we're left wondering whether it's true or not, Sherry, it only makes it real or authentic. But I would say that if you can put a twist on anything, it's the unexpected and we are drawn to the unexpected. And if you can get us and it feels genuine for you, I think that's the key question, that you can make us laugh. There's nothing like taking us through a an amazing story and for us to get a laugh at the end it's almost breaks tension for us if you're going 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 and it's a great way for us to laugh and remember your mother in sort of a poignant way so I'm going to leave that with you to have some fun with that and just try as they suggested a number of endings and maybe talk to a few Toastmasters you trust and just see how it plays out and see what they think of it yes yeah Ned has asked is there a big difference between tall tales and other forms of storytelling? I, th I think we've actually covered this, but just to reiterate, yes, there is a difference because the tall tale needs to have the unexpected, the exaggeration, the unbelievable, the all of those, whereas storytelling doesn't necessarily have to have those to be a good story. So yes, I, I think there is a difference between tall tales and other forms of storytelling, yes. And then Kevin asked, can we use one or two slides? There's no rule that says you can't. My personal thought though, is that when you're using a slide, there's very little room left on the side of the screen for the speaker. For you. Yes. So we're not able to see the speaker as well. And my personal thought is that in a, especially a contest, I, I personally would find it a bit distracting, but there's nothing that says you can't, Kevin. It's entirely up to you. Two things that I wanted to mention, Laura, I've seen a couple of tall tales and the suggestion is if you've got props that would add to the tall tale contest, that's a great way to enhance it. And I've also seen tall tale speakers where they had like a, a one picture, for example, like a cartoon in which they showed it up at the, at the beginning or during the middle of the speech, and then they removed it so that we got the prop, but we didn't necessarily go through the slides where slides, as they talked about, can diminish your sort of speaking connection with the audience. Yes, I agree. Any other thoughts, ideas, questions, concerns? <laughs> Does, hmm. Mara. I have a question. Um, what is, what do you guys as experienced Toastmasters, how do you begin to select a topic for tall tales? Do you just have one or two things in mind or you, 
that's the thing I'm unsure about is getting started on the actual topic. First of all, I, I use the notebook function on my phone to make notes. If I get a thought and I'm not somewhere that I can write it down, it goes in here. And I keep a pad of paper next to the bed with a pen on the coffee table on the kitchen counter, because when I'm thinking about writing a speech, it's those thoughts that come to you when you don't have a pen or, or you're, you're distracted. Those are the ones that are always the best. So my suggestion to anybody who wants to write speeches, make the notes when it's in your mind, like write it down when it comes to you. It might only be two or three words or a sentence or a phrase, but if it's a good one, you can build around, you can build the whole speech around one good sentence, right? That, that's how I do it. And honestly, I can't remember back to when I was a new Toastmaster, but I suspect I've always had more than my share of things to say. I think Mark, Mark has a question, Laura. Yes, Mark. Hi. Hi. It was just more of a comment for the people that are looking like I have a virtual background tonight. And if you notice when Katrina was speaking, I don't know if it's just on my screen, but at the very bottom, there was some blurring. And if you're using hand motions against a virtual background, you have to be very slow and specific or else you lose them. So just for those that might be newer to competing, I would suggest not a virtual background if you can get away from it. Just my two cents on it. Others may have a different thought. No, I agree with you. The, the virtual backgrounds can really smear your your motions on the screen yeah laura i just wanted to go back and add about the ideas i heard that if you can take your normal situations like getting stuck in traffic not being able to drive somewhere and you take those situations that have happened to you and then you start to exaggerate that that's turning a regular story into a tall tale so that's, that's just food, food for thought it started off like any other trip to Costco. <laughs> right. Right. It, it can be the most mundane idea. But when your imagination gets involved, it can turn into something incredibly funny, incredibly suspenseful, perfect tall tale. But I really would, if there's anybody here this evening that has a thought that they're thinking about working on or, or fleshing out, it would be interesting to hear what your thoughts are. I think, are Katri I think Katrina had a question or a point or a, a topic she wanted to discuss. Ah, okay. Well, somebody was she? asking, I'm gonna keep my camera off because I'm in my kitchen. <laughs> but somebody was asking about um, coming up with speech ideas and I actually had a different idea for tonight where I was going to talk about going to a seance and getting advice on leadership from Sir Winston Churchill. <laughs> and I think it's a great idea, but it would take time to perfect the accent and choose the quotes. And I just ended up running out of time. So then I was thinking, I have to come up with a different idea that I'm comfortable with. So I sometimes have, I'll start thinking about ideas whenever I know that I have to do a speech or if it's on pathways. When I finish one speech, I start looking at the next one and thinking what I might want to do. And the one I select is often the one I'm comfortable with at the time. So sometimes if you have several ideas, like Sherry, if you want to do two different speeches, I would prepare both and see which one you're most comfortable delivering. Yeah, like, like all the rest of the speech contests, the success of it often comes down to the speaker's comfort zone. What, because it is going to be your story, your sense of humor, your gestures, your facial expressions, your, your everything. So choose the one that feels the best to you. Chris. One of the things, if you're looking for ideas for stories, if you've ever been a Girl Guide or a Boy Scouts and you, listen to stories around the campfire you know about the jersey devil or about local the dead man from dead man's lake whatever those are tall tales those are not designed to be true and they were designed to entertain 
young kids. And those are the types of things you can look for. And, you know, if you really are stuck, you can always go on the internet and look at tall tales or tales around the campfire. And those things should give you a, a just a huge amount of ideas. <clears throat> Be careful to keep it original, though. Um, I noticed that Larry Newhort from Bedstone is in the audience tonight, and I'm sure he's going to remember this. This goes back to, I don't know, 1989 or 1990, somewhere in there. And it was the top level of the contest. And a gentleman got up and he gave just a brilliant rendition of a speech that had already been done. It was basically a joke about how men spend their whole lives wanting to go back to where they came from. <laughs> and um, about, oh, I can't even remember how it, how it all went, but you're, you're born, you grow up and you get to a certain age and then you wanna go back to where you were before you were born. And you spend the rest of your life trying to get back in there. And, and it was, he did it extremely well. It was really, really well presented, but it wasn't his speech. And so I, I agree. I think just looking at the internet at um, Campfire Stories is a really good place to start, but make sure that your end result is just yours, your own original story. Well, we've got seven minutes left, but we didn't have, oh yes, Emma. Hi, are we still willing to bat around topic ideas? Yes, absolutely. I, this is where my memory has failed me, but Laura, we had a conversation or an, a Facebook exchange or something about something around dealing with the heat and taking your clothes off and opening the windows and then the catches that were on the freaking bus were not in our Yes, house. yes. And I yes. wanted to, because I traveled by transit, so I wanted to do something about that, but I, I can't remember if, if that, was that what we were talking about? It seems to me that uh, if my memory is right, and this was several weeks ago now, I think, Emma, but I think I shared a joke about something about having a hot flash and taking my clothes off and everybody in the store was very disapproving. Uh, and that's how you and I got talking about it. But yes. And then it was, yeah, I morphed into doing it on the on a bus instead of at my home. And I think that's an excellent idea. All but right. much like mine, you would have to be careful to couch your language in surprise and dismay. And, right. You know, but I think I think it would be very funny. Very, very funny. Yeah. Okay, I will try and work on something along that lines. Thank you for the reminder. Okay. Yes, Val. Okay, I was just reading some of the comments in the chat. And I think we should talk about the highly exaggerated uh, superhuman strength that that people are talking about in the chat, like Paul Bunyan and uh, some of those other people, the Mad Hatter and all those people, that all those tall tales, that tall tales are encompassing that but also others because like you didn't in your tall tale you didn't have a superhuman strength there you had high exaggeration with irony and puns and and twists at the end so I think we do need to touch on that because as we're all learning and we're trying to figure out how we're going to write this to flesh out how you know does a tall tale especially when some of us are going to be judging others for this contest do, is it a tall tale if someone doesn't have a superhuman strength, for instance? Make sure everyone's kind of along the same wavelength out of the 60, 53 people that are here right now. Yes, yes, you're right. No, you don't have to have superhuman strength and you don't need to be Paul Bunyan, no. Um, I'm just, somebody wrote something down here that was really appropriate. Now I can't remember what... Oh, that's interesting. Marvin said protests are more common in tall tales than the international speech contest. So I wonder if Marvin wants to speak to that on what these protests are about, maybe, or someone else. Originality well, for sure, but yes. Well, I can, yeah, I can speak to that. And I'm, I remember what I was, um, 
a judge back in the 90s, there were several protests in tall tales contests. And that's because a lot of the tall tales weren't, weren't, weren't original. Oh, or, on original. Or may not sound original. Yeah. So it was tougher to find out if, the, if it was original or not. Um, and back then, internet wasn't as big as it is now. Of course, that was the right. 90s. But it, it still has to be original, of course. And I remember back then, there were several protests going on because pe a lot of judges didn't think it was, was original, and it was, or, or vice versa. And I guess, I guess it's harder to tell, and, it's, and more unoriginality comes up in Star Tales. Okay. And that makes sense too, Marvin. It does. That makes sense. Because, you know, tall tales have been part of our storytelling history forever. Since the first man sat down around the campfire and started to tell what happened that day, people have been exaggerating ever since. Mm -hmm. So, yes. So if you're going to, if you're going to use some sort of superhuman strength or or superhero ability, then it would make sense that it should be an original ability. You know, I woke up one morning, opened my eyes, and oh my God, I suddenly had the ability to see through people's clothing. Something like that, something completely original. And that, yeah, that would be mine. That'd be where my mind went immediately. Yeah, I was just going to say, did you notice a trend, Laura? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was going to just pop in on that one and say, uh, one of the stories that I used to like was Popeye the Sailor Man. And then he ate spinach and he became really strong. It was a really good story for kids because then they'd eat their spinach and they'd become strong. And I was thinking, well, what if I had something different that I ate that made me strong and able to do things that I could never do before? And I'm sure Nandini has figured out what that was that I would be eating. But, you know, um, we could do that. So we're just popping in from a story we know to something new, but learning from that story. And instead of eating something and making you strong, you ate something and suddenly you could sing like a bird or... Well, there you go. And, but yeah. I don't think my chosen food would make me sing like a bird because it kind of clogs up the throat. I'm talking about chocolate, <laughs> but but it could it could potentially make you see through people's clothes. But so, it could yeah. make me sexier. That's <laughs> just, just say we couldn't handle that, Darlene. We couldn't handle more sexy. I have heard men say there's nothing sexier than a woman with a chocolate bar in her hand. Oh, see, <laughs> or a golf club, <laughs> or a golf club. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we have come to the end of the Tall Tales workshop, and I want to thank everybody for coming out on a Monday night and spending some time with us. This has been a lot of fun for me, and I hope for all of you, and more than anything, I hope that when you sign off of here this evening, you are not only more informed on what a tall tale is, but that you're even more motivated to write one yourself and compete because I am so looking forward to this Tall Tales contest and I cannot wait to see the speeches that it brings. And this is your chance to be creative, to be a, an exaggerator and tell the biggest, hugest, most whopping lie of your Toastmaster career. We don't often get free reign for something like that. So fellow Toastmasters, take advantage of it. I wanna thank my golden girls this evening, the Circle of Gold team, Nandini, Val, and Darlene. Thank you so much for your insight and valuable contribution this evening. Thank you, Karen, for being our Sergeant at Arms and Jackie for being our timer. And Mr. Mulvihill, I still think you're sexy. Thank you all very much this evening. And I hope to honest to God, see some of you face to face soon. Take good care, everybody. Stay safe. Good night. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you Bye -bye. so much for everything. Thank you. Great workshop. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Good stuff. Thanks, everybody.
Good night. Thanks. Yeah, thanks to cats for having us all. Yes. And you're all welcome back anytime. <laughs> we love having guests and we've got lots of room for members as well if you'd like to join us. <laughs> and we're How much for room it. in a tall tale format? How you, much room? You snuck that in so smoothly, oh. Karen. Yeah. <laughs>